is Anna Lejikova. Uh, I live in New Zealand. It's currently Friday already here morning. And I moved to New Zealand from Russia uh, nine years ago. And here I started so, uh, IT. So before, before in Russia, I was doing a lot of different things. I started as a professional musician and uh, started public relations, taught public relations. Uh, studied sociology, so, um, even began, began writing my thesis in economic sociology, but then decided now making babies might be a little bit funny. <laughs> so I uh, worked in communications, had my com agencies, uh, worked in project management and constructions and management, all of it. But after I moved to New Zealand, uh, it was um, trying to survive just given music lessons at the beginning and then when my younger kids started school uh, I started 18 here and then it was a very um, fast career from front end full stack started machine learning and artificial intelligence in the Victoria University of Wellington uh, it was a lot of mobile then moved to cloud DevOps DevSecOps and now what I'm doing is literally a coach is cloud security architect uh, and uh, being exposed to all this different stuff uh, helps me to just be not a um, usual developer engineer you have, but also bring uh, my um, business and um, academic uh, and sociology background. So currently I work in Kogo. It's an impact like fintech host carbon tracking API and consumer app enables users and businesses worldwide to measure, reduce and compensate for their impact on people and planet. Uh, thanks to our marketing team to provide, <laughs> provide them with this data and why it is important to know for you that uh, we are uh, growing so fast, hiring, uh, expanding products, expanding time zones, countries, all of it, and work with uh, a lot of banks and uh, other financial corporations. It means that this, start uh, this company who started as a startup and didn't even think about having a security person now uh, considering it's very seriously. And uh, I'm very happy to work in there because it's such a greenfield and uh, a lot of opportunities to start it right uh, not to deal with legacy but this is from technology point of view uh, and uh, what this talk is about is about people so people are not so easy to change and you can't start from scratch with them so that's what we will talking about here so uh sorry what we've got in here uh People, from the company point of view, it's not only engineers, it's all employees. And uh, for employees, uh, what I find lacking is uh, fear. And fear is of just because not knowing, not being attacked. Uh, if you didn't work in the uh, company that uh, was under ransom attack or it was not affected directly, or even if you worked in this company, it was so huge that it just was not affected directly, then all of these scary stories are just news and like one example when we were uh, uh, walking in a shared space at the beginning when we didn't have our office in Kogo um, we, we, we walked in co-working space and one um, no, day I just stayed longer and there was a computer left on the desk from one of the employees and uh, it was open uh, there was a screen a saver and I was like oh must have been locked and I touched it, touch screen, it was not locked because she thought that she had a lock, but the uh, screen server lock was set up for five hours or six hours, something like this. And it's a co-working space. Anyone can walk in, walk out of this. Yeah, this type of things. On the other hand, we've got developers who often, especially expert ones, senior ones that are so overconfident that they know that sometimes they just sometimes uh, have to ask you, please prove me how it can be hacked. Then I will believe you that we will need to secure it. If I don't know how it can be hacked, can be, uh, this is not true at all, right? So um, we know about these problems and open computers, um, shared passwords, um, we 
try to train. There's a lot of education. I worked in a bank and we regularly had these um, courses that you had to um, complete with the multiple questions and them that you had to get right, correct. And uh, then you've got this check, um, passed it. Uh, but this just, it's, there's no use at all. I mean, like how you can even relate it, what you just read on the slides to what you're doing day to day job. Just like, yeah, it's good for compliance. We know they're not taking place for training, but no practical usage in there. But uh, for security training and other stuff, and we got a lot of courses like this, and then people just like, find them as obstacle courses that they just have to do and just forget about it uh later we've got some improvements in there they now look more fun they've got some interactions some maybe fun animations but still same obstacle course that just people uh, go through and forget uh that's what uh, that's when people started to talk about like mindset it's not only about security i'm sure you've heard of growth mindset or different mindset that mindset we need if you want to change it attitude to something you need to change mindset so what is mindset yeah this is google the established set of attitudes held by someone there's some pictures in here this is a very, by the way, if you are like uh, interested, this is a nice blog post that explains a lot of uh, what this is about and how it can be approached. It's the nature of mindsets by Ash Buchanan. Buchanan. Uh, all nicely laid out, um, like thought through all the categories and all the stuff and uh, mindset shape the lives we lead, the actions we take, and the future possibilities of the world we live in. All good words, all cool things. Uh, it's also from this uh, post uh, um, quote from Mahatma Gandhi, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words. Yeah. But in practice, how do we do this? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's make a detour. in what was that in, in in april yes it was april 2021 uh new zealand was not already in lockdown at that moment so i'm not in auckland i'm not in lockdown have some freedoms from covid stuff but this was like when there was no covid in the country but all covid all over the world and there is a program in new zealand called hekua that provided um, education uh, with credits for American students. So American students would come here, they would work uh, in some companies as volunteers doing social good, then they would travel the country, visit um, local uh, EVs, Stripe in Maori, and uh, learn their cultural traditions, um, well, view of the world, all the stuff. And uh, then they would go to some place, stay there for a couple of weeks and uh, write the essay and paper. So it was offered only for American students, but COVID uh, came and the program closed because no one could come to New Zealand. So they decided to offer it to local people. And because uh, our company pro provided space for these volunteers, I've got an invite and decided, okay, why not to go? So I went there, uh, I stayed in an um, uh, EV, uh, Natirani, uh, EV means tribe, it's a Maori tribe. And uh, for three days it was there, I stayed in Marae, so sleeping in a big um, hut uh, all together on the floor and mattresses. And uh, they took us to the local area showed it to us and talked about the uh, beliefs and um, traditions. So this is area is a mantra of Pejo Eres, the center of North Island of New Zealand. Uh, I'll, I'll have a map later of a small map of this area. So you'll know better, but this is the, ah, by the way, I'm not sure. It's the tallest uh, mountain of North Island uh, and it's a former volcano. 
I'm not sure how much active it is, but other parts of the Tongariro, it's called Tongariro uh, chain of mountains, and this is mountain, Mount Roapejo, Ohakune, it's the name of the town. And we went there. Uh, it was very, very beautiful. And they talk about us, uh, to talk to us about the mountain and that how it connects to their world that when you die, your spirit will go up to the mountain. So it means all ancestors go through this and then to the uh, uh, outer world and that this is a sacred place. There's a lot of uh, like the ice in there when it melts, it uh, goes um, just from the sacred space. That's just connection between our world and ancestors uh, outer world. Yeah, it was amazing. There was rainbow for a couple of hours, just appearing, disappearing. And uh, this ice melting goes down through in rivers, in the form of rivers and the mountain rivers. And then we looked at this and uh, this area is sacred. So this point is uh, where we were like allowed to go and we were not allowed to go further uh, because this is like whenever you go in there, you become, you're present in there and present not only for the stones and stuff, but also for the all the spirits and um, energy and all the things in there when you, uh, and you should not disturb the space if you're not allowed to. Uh, then after this place, like mountain, we went to the river. And this is water from ice melting uh, and uh, river has also got some spirits. You can talk to them, you can pet them. So let's try you next to the river, try to uh, just touch it like you are um, petting a uh, dog or cat, something like this, and you will feel it. It's a very interesting feeling. And uh, this water, not only uh, life from the like um, biology point of view, like environment point of view, but also life continues from spiritual point of view. Then we went to the forest and this rivers, they feed all of this life. This water is everywhere. And uh, yeah, this is New Zealand forest, my favorite place on the planet. Uh, when we're open, please come and visit. When we open. Uh, and all this is fed. And again, not just water, but also spirit. And means that we are also 90 something percent of water. And this water is not, not only molecules, it's full of all other stuff in there. So that's how they see the world in a holistic view that everything is uh, part of everything else. And it's not just it's not just parts, it's a one big thing interconnected. And uh, this is a very, very, very life-changing experience just to feel how to how I see the world, how I feel myself in the world. Uh, and then they showed us uh, a place and told us a story. So this is Treaty of Waitangi, when uh, Crown bought the lands from Maori and uh, started doing things on it. Because like Crown thought, now we own the land, we can do things. And in the uh, 20th century, uh, I'm uh, it's like I'm not sure exactly what was the year, but 70s. The, the project started in 50s. It was called Big Think Project, and um, this exact project was started. I'm not sure 70s or 80s, something like this, like 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago. And this is the uh, you, you can't see my cursor right on the screen, Dagmar. Yes, we can see your screen. Oh, awesome. Okay. No, I mean like the cursor, my mouse cursor. Yes, yes. Awesome. So this is Mount Rape who we're talking about. This is Tongariro or mountain, and this is Mount Tongariro, and this is Mount Narhoe. Narhoe, it's the famous, you've, if you watched Lord of the Rings, you've seen it. This is Mordor, this mountain. <laughs> so this is what's in the movie. And uh, this is our rivers, and the river I showed you is... Uh, 
I think this one, not sure, but one of this one, this one. So this water melts in here, goes through these mountains, go to the rivers, uh, goes in here. These dots are catchments. I'll have a, not a very good, but still picture of it. So where water goes into, from the river into the um, tunnel. And there are 21 or 24 of them, something like this. And then uh, all this water uh, from the catchments go into this um, aqueduct. Then it goes to this dam. Then there is a huge, huge tunnel going here and here. And then there are power stations. And then it goes to this uh, lake, finally in Lake Taupa. And you can see it on this. There's a river coming out of the Lake Taupa. And there are six or eight more power stations. And all this to produce energy, electricity. Uh, what does not see a uh, show like, uh, yeah, good electricity. This is the green electricity uh, that we want to uh, promote more, uh, like uh, opposite to coal, oil. Uh, by the way, that's one of the reasons why uh, AWS is building data center in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and Google Cloud is almost like, I'm not sure if they're building it or not, but they're opening one. But AWS is building one because this is the green uh, energy that will uh, help them to become um, uh, carbon uh, zero, not neutral carbon zero, that they claim, all three main clouds claimed to be by 2030. Uh, and this water in here, it just, okay, some catchments, water goes in, but how it looks in real life. So this is, these are two catchments from this one. So here, uh, it's not very good picture, sorry that I was able to find from the trip, but on the left, this is the one of the streams. Then here, like these small things are the um, like uh, metal grid. And then water goes into this metal grid and disappears in there. So this is metal just covering this uh, aqueduct and it's going in there. And this water, it's only water that comes from here. It's a pipe, maybe like 10 centimeters diameter or 20, 10, I think, 10 centimeters diameter, and it's all that allowed to go back into the riverbed from this water. On the right side is the one that the, uh, like, the rivers are up here, and this water is 80%, uh, then 20% goes to the aqueduct, and this is gray thin, it's a um, shutter. And it, a few years ago, maybe like, two and a half, three years ago, it was shut, full, like fully shut. So nothing was coming out. So this was all dry. The rest of the catchments are like this one before, or like this one, they're all shut. So if you go back, all this water is not going south. It's all going north. So what people did, people just turned the water against the natural floor all of this water. It means that there is no life uh, moving through this um, highway, like water highway for life, not, not species like uh, fish or any other, like uh, this type of things, no seeds, nothing. So this is dry, dead um, riverbeds. And when you look at this, it's a catastrophe. And uh, this water means uh, not going south, means that there is no, this all forests uh, feel like fields, pastures, all of it is not uh, getting this water it was getting for, I don't know, from the beginning when this all happened. The, 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 this uh, territory, like this mountain, this water like from the beginning of this nature. And um, the, uh, the people who, uh, like farmers, they, mm, say that they when there's a drought they, they suffer because there's just not enough water on the ground uh, to feed uh, all the plants because it just and but it's in there melting from the ice but it's not getting in there so why i'm telling you this story because uh the when the in 90s i think it was it was 2000s 
uh, Crown decided to give back uh, some of the land to Mara Evis. So now Evie own this water, so uh, um, land. So Natirani, now the uh, legal owners of this land, so they uh, filed a case to Environment Court to open this um, uh, catchment and just to get this water back. But the power company uh, fought back and there was a lot of going through the different appellate, uh, appeals, appeal court for many years, a lot of money, uh, a very big uh, media campaign um, painting uh, EV as an evil and greedy and all this stuff. And at some point they thought, no, we can't do this anymore this way. We will um, need, we'll need a different approach. So they found a way to send a message to this power company board and they invited them here to show this. And they invited them, they talked to them about the mountain, about the river, about the forest, about the role it plays in uh, all of uh, Evie's around, just people's lives. And it changed this company, people who were making decisions mindset. They, they saw this, they changed their vision of this problem. And then when the uh, ice broke and they, there's a process ongoing and the outcome of this process is this uh, shutter, the gray one was open for 80% and only 20% going to the catchment. This one, I hope now it's better because they just decided how much percentage will go into the aqueduct, how much will go into the river and also opening it. And they hope that this like little by little, they will open uh, most of the catchments at least to have some water in there to provide this um, transport for life. So after I learned about the story, I just thought, mm, it's so much, it reminded me of conflicts we have uh, in our like, area. And uh, it reminded me of a story. My friend told me she works in a bank uh, and she's uh, like a, not an IT. She uses uh, Office 365 and she told me a story. Oh, the security people, they're so evil. I created a workflow in Office 365 and uh, I really need it because it helps me to uh, just automate my jobs. And it's a very simple workflow, but I can't use it because uh, I'm not allowed just to use it. I need an approval. I need a test or something. I understand what I need. They came back to me. They're not answering messages. It's been two months already. This is terrible. Security is terrible. It's a simple thing I need to do while they're not. You've been you've all been through these talks. I'm sure you've heard it. And when I heard this, I thought, but it's what we like, it's the same problem. There is a conflict uh, because people are just in different worlds. They've got different like mindsets. And uh, how do we like um, what this Evie used in this situation, this conflict that helped them to uh, get out of the stale situation and create some progress, not just to change everything in one day. And again, what I'm going to talk here, it's not a silver bullet. It's really just the one catchment at a time. Uh, and I talked to the EV chief and then I talked to people around it and uh, just uh, other Mara people just started ask, asking them questions about like this vision, conflict solving and changing people mindsets and then I came up with um, three ideas it's not just a full list that can be done but for me it was easier to grasp the three to start to implement in them to use them and they were oh, sorry Kayako uh, storytelling and map is not a territory uh, and we just like walk through them one by one and see how or what that means and what uh, how they can be applied. Kayako, who? Uh, kayako means, if you look at the dictionary, it will just tell you teacher, but it's not correct translation. Kai means food, and it can be just not like what you eat, but any feed. Uh, and Ako means teaching, 
uh, uh, knowledge. And then here, it's the proper translation to English would be knowledge feeder. But uh, it's knowledge feeder, it's not the same as teacher. We used to this uh, classical teaching setup when there is an expert and authority that tells you some truth. They tell you something, you need to, you just from the start, you have to believe it, uh, accept it, learn it, and then you'll be tested for it. Uh, and it comes from like everywhere, everything, every teaching right now is one way. So there is a source of knowledge that if you decide to learn it, you accept it that it's a source of truth and something you just need to learn. Luckily, this changing in modern education system, my kids are 11 and 15 years old. They, when they go to New Zealand school and New Zealand school is very, very changing. And uh, I think Maori culture and this Kayako uh, uh, ideas also uh, influence it. And the idea is that the teacher is not someone who tells you the truth. Teacher is a person like Kayako, the person who gives you some knowledge, feed you like food for thought, and you absorb it and um, learn by just, this is just a feed. It doesn't have to be like true, it's something, it's just food. And then you need to digest it, you need to grow it, you need to make something from it. But most important aspect of Kayako is it's a two-way process. The person who is teaching is learning from the person they're teaching at the same time. So there is no teaching student. They're just two people who feed each other knowledge. You can be in a position of Kayako. Uh, it means that you're not just saying something to someone and test them. It means you provide them food and then you get this food from them. So all this constant feedback loop. So how it can be used uh, in security. Uh, this is the very nice uh, um, picture I found at Auth0 website. And uh, this is like classical stuff, but on the left, like shift and left paradigm is that get security before everything is deployed and now we just push it to pen testing, even internal testing, security testing or whatever. And this is nice words, secure coding practices, threat modeling, uh, um, all these like threat modeling workshops, programs, education. But the Kayako part on this, what I've been doing in our company is that uh, I'm as a security person involved in the product design from the beginning. So not in the building stage, from the beginning, they've got an idea, they got some uh, business idea, they start documenting it and I'm invited uh, to just to observe from the beginning. Uh, and then to raise any questions if they are like how uh, this idea, what implications it got, how it can be secured and all the stuff. Then when they are the building stage, uh, I uh, like there's a team that working on this product. They just started building it. I'm there at every stand up. I'm there at every uh, pull request. And uh, it means that I can see, uh, we use only infrastructure as code, uh, all the templates, cloud formation in AWS. Uh, it means that then when they create resources in the template, I review them. If uh, the, they've got policies, not using default AWS policies, are the policies correct or tight enough or all the stuff. And it's done as a code review, not as the out audit at the end. And uh, Threat modeling, uh, that's what we are planning just, I think in a couple of weeks, we are having this um, uh, threat modeling uh, exercises. And then uh, what I want to do, uh, we tried it already, but uh, that team was reformed. Now it's a new team. So to embed threat modeling questions in the story template. And it's not just put it in there, it be there for them to help them 
to uh, use it properly. On another hand, when I'm there and the stand-ups at retros, uh, at uh, pull requests, code reviews, I hear them. I hear their complaints. I hear how their struggles and I hear their ideas. Uh, I see how they use um, guardrails or uh, limitations borders I put for them. And uh, it means that sometimes it's as configured, not user friendly. Yes, it's doing a job, but the because they need to, uh, so the, 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 how, uh, the, how much the labor to be able to implement it is so much higher than it reduces the value of the security control, but it still needs to be there. <laughs> and that's why when I hear what exactly the problem is, oh yeah, it's because it's not, for example, you have to enter this key and the session all the time you use it. There is no remember function or something like this. Uh, or number of hours is too short for this environment. You doesn't it doesn't have to be one hour um, session key expiry. It can be twelve hours or eight hours for the uh, working day because it's not production and staging. How do you know about this? How do you hear about this? Uh, just by being there, and that's like I'm there for them to give them knowledge when they need it. And I'm here to learn from them how they use it and what problems they have. So this is this kayak concept. I know you were, uh, ah, another one is uh, pair programming. And uh, and the keywords you can use in there is uh, champions. Uh, I know that the main question from people will be, how do you scale it in a huge organization? You just can't be there. That's where the champions come in. And there's one talk uh, later, to, one talk tomorrow. Yep, I think tomorrow about the uh, security champions. It's a known, well-known idea already, but now you can look at it from a different angle. So not just champions doing things, but these champions also can, also can grow into mentors, into kayakers that are not just leading the way, but also, uh, be being kayak or change mindsets around them. Um, yep, and mentorship as a skill, it's something to look uh, into these people and when the champions, your potential champions, and uh, especially when you hire for security positions, it's another skill that I think very valuable when you look at the person, not only just certificates and the experience knowledge, but also can they be a good mentor to anyone? Can they be a good teacher, but not teacher, kayak, or can they share it? Can they listen? Uh, next one is telling a story. So we had who, kayak, doing what? Telling a story. So how these kayakers can uh, change this um, mindset? What should they do? And it's not only our traditional uh type of delivering knowledge. Uh, do you remember the mindset stuff I told you at the beginning, all these chart sets and quotes uh, stuff, uh, I doubt. But I'm sure you remember the story I told you about these conflicts because it's a story. It's a fairy tale and a fairy tale, it's a very simple um, plot uh, you can remember and you can retell. And there is something you can connect to and there is something you can uh, like learn and use some moral from it. Uh, we, fairy tales, were not fairy tales before all this uh, scientific revolution and enlightenment era. They were stories. They were part, they, they were main uh, way of education. But with time, we still have stories, but and they still educate. Question is what they educate us with, like what knowledge they bring. And uh, they, there is some stuff. Uh, you can look at this message they send. Um, I'm not saying it's better good. There's some good in there that teaches you some good qualities maybe in life. I don't know. Uh, but in other sides of the world, like scientific, science, serious, adult, uh, business, we are not telling stories anymore. 
because we say, ah, oh, this is childish. This is something we should like, uh, it's, it's for kids or it's for entertainment. So it, it stopped being for kids only right now. It was only for kids, but now it's entertainment, all this Hollywood and uh, comic world and all this stuff. But stories uh, is a very, very powerful tool of um, delivering information. And so what I just, what I've been doing in this company, I was uh, translating, bringing uh, what I read to the space in the company to uh, create this like uh, some context with stories uh, uh, in the company, how it works. For example, I've got a lot of mail list I read every day and like Hagen News, so I love Cora Queen. I hope he will get this message some reference somewhere and uh he by the way he started uh last week in aws security uh flavored um newsletter uh, regularly and it's very very useful if you're an aws highly recommend uh and uh i read this news and then i um just retell them in our slack channel in a general channel, if it's just on general security on passwords or something like this for employees or in our engineering channel, if it's a little bit more techy. And I found out that this, and, and, and what's important, I do it regularly. And so I tell the stories, I make this feel like becoming a norm, something that happens regularly, that's something that exists. And uh, with employees, there was a very, very interesting sort of like some outcome once. Uh, I posted a story about scamming uh, and how people just uh, fall into these traps, how people get scammed. And one of the employees uh, answered, like started a thread in there, how he was scammed some time ago, like how he lost a few thousand of dollars, how he felt. It was a really, really sensitive coming out thing. And, uh, but because there was space created to make it um, uh, not something sudden, but uh, appropriate and safe, he was able to share it. And people started to add to it and discussing it and it became something real. And it just, this was a very, very amazing feeling of this like uh, fireplace story. Uh, and uh, for engineers, they always like uh, raise the question. And once I saw that was some talk, I like the idea news I posted some time ago. And then maybe three or four weeks later in the pull request on some code, people just made changes. Ah, oh, now I thought about it because it could be this threat, this and this. And then I remembered, oh my gosh, but this is connected to the new, new news I posted some time ago. Or another story that um, it's not only news, when we go to roundtables, conferences, it's not only schematical slides, like this is this, this, this. This is not only teaching, it's also telling stories, sharing experiences and learnings and in such a way that can be retold and reused. And I went to a security roundtable at one point, and there was an amazing story about um, phishing email and then how Facebook was blocked and why it happened. And we had the same setup in our company. And I just posted how this is um, the story. And then I got, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to change it. So it was accepted uh that we need by people not just like something directive and some order or something you want to uh enforce on them but something like it's a story i can connect to it do i see something around me that i can like apply it to yes and then there is no defensive feelings in this person and then they if uh the more they repeat this kind of things they uh, more it becomes a part of their everyday life context, the more their mindset has changed. And the third one is who, kayak, or what, telling the story when or where on the territory. So while this conflict was uh, mm, like really like one of the things that solved this conflict was not just going to the court, uh, the, the real one conflict, not just going to the court and discussing it um, using papers, but bringing these people 
to this place and showing them and talking about this, telling the story there at the river, not in the courtroom. So what uh, map is not a territory. I'm sure uh, some of you heard about this. This is a new, not new concept. Uh, there's some, uh, a lot of um, interesting frameworks and ideas came out of it already, but what does it mean? So what is a map? Map is not only a map, like on the left side, um, this is the map of this area, but anything that is not this place is also a map. So this picture is a map. Me talking about this area is a map, you can imagine it. And this one is also a map. Yeah, this is a river in New Zealand. It's amazingly not cold when you touch it. And this river is very talkative. I really like it. And uh, so this is uh, everything that's not real situation or place is a map. How we can apply it to security one, like security situation, because what would be not a, sorry, uh, not a map. Capture the flag, hackathons, advent of the code, uh, they are all good because they move us like from, okay, day-to-day -day job. There's no attacks, there's no problems, there is no uh, um, situations you can like uh, get adrenaline in you. So we create the spaces that people can, uh, not normal for compared to day-to-day -day job, but something, but it's still a map compared to what you produce, what you do in at your day-to-day -day work. Uh, but still good. So this is better than nothing and, and good things, yeah. But there's still maps. Ranges. It's a very aggressive picture. I don't like it, but uh, I couldn't find any peaceful <laughs> pictures of ranges. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, I went through, I, I tried one of the, was, I don't remember the name, some company that they provide ranges and ranges like the security ranges is not, um, again, not a new concept. The idea is that there's some product environment created, it's got vulnerabilities from the beginning and you go in there uh, and your, your job is just like your task challenge to find all of them to hack it. And uh, that's how you learn this uh, hacker mindset uh the uh like enemy what mindset to be able to build defenses against it so i took one of these um thank you OWASP to provide in a free um offer by the way you can find it i think OWASP provides it and as i'm a OWASP member uh i i use this opportunity and for one month we did this there was a website and we did this um like hacking and you were getting points for finding all these vulnerabilities uh, and it was a totally, uh, it was familiar, but totally not relevant to techno, tech stack for me at all, just, just nothing. And uh, I would say I never used this tech stack in my career because for me it was a little bit outdated. Um, so, um, but anyway, it was amazing how it changed your thinking and then how you start thinking in a breaker way. And I think it's, it, you need this feeling when you are in a threat modeling mode and uh, really want to think, look at your thing, what you're building from the um, breaker point of view. This is cool, but then this was the problem with that it was not relevant uh, to what we are doing. So when you've got your developers and you send them to this range or you buy this access for, for them to learn, how do you find one that will fit uh, the tech stack they're using right now, the job? Because one, you do this XML attack or something in the um, um, uh, Apache uh, server, but you are in AWS cloud serverless and uh, using a uh, React um, um, single page application. Totally different. It's still vulnerable, but with different vulnerabilities. Uh, and then I started to look, oh, there are other ways. So there's things that people, that this is their business, they provide it uh, as, the, as the business. Um, but what I was, maybe I don't, uh, I couldn't find it. If you know such a resource, send me, 
or if you want to build such a thing i would love to join and do it together something kind of lego thing for cloud uh, and for any like for every major cloud uh, you just uh, it's um, templates and you combine these templates uh, to create uh, and with known vulnerabilities so i've got s threes okay you've got there's a template for three vulnerabilities i've got uh ec2 and vpc okay this is the template how to set up a vpc and ec2 with vulnerabilities so you just combine this looking as as close as your product and then you deploy it in an account and get the developers in and tell them uh can you find all of it so something like this but again it's not as close like it's closer uh, but also uh, what I like uh, I'm doing, I when I see something in our code, like oh I see in the news this was hacked and this is what we use, I always try to point, look at this, this is the same thing that was in the news that we are using in here, or trying to uh, create these connections between uh, vulnerabilities that are reported somewhere on some website with our code and pointing finger to it. Uh, for the employees, it's very cool. You can just like uh, create a few, um, write uh, some code and uh, upload it in a few of memory sticks and just throw away in the office and see who will be the first to put it into the machine, right? <laughs> this kind of fun. Uh, now I need to implement it before they watch this talk, my colleagues. <laughs> uh, so the Again, this is not a silver bullet. This is not like, okay, we will do this now only. This is not discarding all of the things we are doing with traditional education, certification, all this stuff. This is just an extra facet in this multifaceted thing that I hope now we'll be able to use and see things with extra filter, extra layer. And uh, to use this uh, who, uh, what, when, like Kayako telling the story. Uh, uh, on the territory. So I think uh, for me, the lesson, like the, the idea I'm living with and trying to like, that guides my um, things I'm doing in my company is just be there, tell the story, make it feel real. And I understand there's a scaling problem for uh, big enterprises, but uh, I think it's all solvable if you start thinking uh, as this, like distribute this, at the, of this thing is not as the central monolith, but as a distributed system, how we can distribute the, be there, tell the story, make it feel real. And I think it's also possible to apply it to big companies. Um, that's me. Thank you very much. Questions?